spell, but okay. It is Wednesday afternoon, February 27th. I do not know where 2019 is going, but I do know it means we're one day closer. And we are going to see a glorious scene here in our class today, so I hope you're ready because I'm ready. We're going to review very quickly back to verse 11 to get our complete thought because in verse 11 we see heaven open. And I gave us a contrast last time. It's not just the door that was open when Yochanan was caught up to have his vision from above. It was just a door. A door is good for one person to go through. But one person isn't coming back. The main one is coming back. But he is coming back with a whole entourage. So heaven had to be wide open. <laughs> To let us all out. And notice I said a key word there. Yes. Yes. And we saw that the one who comes out in the lead is the one on the white horse that's showing victory already to the Roman world. That when the general would come back from war, he would be riding on the white horse, leading the entourage through the city. Behind him would come his army. Then would come the booty that they had received. And finally the slaves or those who would be executed. All of this showing the power. Now, the Lord is not coming back with those to be executed. But he is coming back on that white horse. He is coming back in victory. He's not coming as he did the first time, lowly, riding on a donkey, fulfilling prophecies such as Zechariah 9, Zechariah 9, but 9, 9 in fact. But he is coming to fulfill the promises of his being glorified. And this is the mighty majesty of our Lord. We're going to see that as we look at the names that are given to him. We saw in verse 11 that he is called faithful and true. Absolutely calling out the fake Antichrist that has been on the scene and, and speaking nothing but lie. Here is truth. Here is the one who is faithful to his word. And I say hallelujah because everything promised to me is going to happen for me the same way everything promised to Israel is going to happen to Israel. If God let down on Israel, I could worry he would let down on me. But he does not, he will not, he will not, he won't, <laughs> he can't. <laughs> okay, he is faithful. He has promised deliverance for the saints. He's promised deliverance for Israel and we see that. We went through that in detail last time, so I'm not going to go into it now, but we see that he is judging in righteousness and in truth. He is the one worthy of judging because he is God and because he uh, took on man's form and he's coming back in that, in his fullness of fully man but fully God also. And he's coming back with that right to, to rule justly and fairly. We saw that he's the lamb that we saw, especially in chapter 5. He is the lion, the lamb who, as if he'd been slain, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion who's the king of the jungle, and he is coming back waging war. You're, you may say making war, but he really isn't making it. The war is going on, and he comes back, and he brings it to that head. He culminates it. He stops it. He annihilates it. Wow, we're going to see what he does. Remember, the first coming was not like that. That's what they were looking for. But they were wrong because he had to deal with the sin question issue. It's not a question, it's an issue. He had to deal with the sin issue. He came lowly, he came humbly, but now God is exalting him. And we're going to see the lion. So let's look at verse 12. I love where we're going. I, I, I mean, it, it's time. Is it not time? Yes, it's time. We haven't gone through seven years to get through the book of Revelation. I'm slow, <laughs> but I beat the period of time the earth is going to endure. <laughs> so if you feel like that's been long, now think about the people who are really living through these circumstances. You know, it's one thing to study it. It's another thing to live through it. And then to see it seven years, there are those who want to say, oh, well, you know, it's not so bad or it's not so long. Hello. That's all I need to say on that. So heaven's open. He's on his white horse. He is faithful. He is true. He is righteous. He is judging. And he is the one who should judge. He will judge holy, H-O-L-Y. And he will judge fairly. He will judge in that truth. He will wage that war. We see in verse 12, his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. Ooh, I can't wait to get to that point. But let's back up and let's do the eyes like fire. This shows divine omniscience. He is all-seeing, all-knowing. Nothing has missed his eyes. Remember the scripture where God said his eyes run to and fro through the earth? 
and he's watching to look for a man who is faithful to him, well, the eyes of the Lord see it all, and he is coming back with fiery eyes. Fire speaks of judgment, speaks of purity. The fire refines, the fire purifies, and he is coming back in that sense that he is going to be judging exactly by what he has seen and what he is seeing and what needs to be taken care of. Keep in Revelation, but jump back to the beginning of Revelation with me, chapter 1. And we had a great um, description in chapter 1. When we studied it in great detail, we saw that we see God the Father and we see God the Son. We saw that as we went through, we'd say, oh, okay, he's speaking of the Father. But then in the next phrase, is, oh, wait a minute, he's speaking of the Son. Then we saw that the names that were given to the Father were also given to the Son in other places. And the names given to the Son were given to the Father in other places. And we said, what? <laughs> the two are one. Deity is seen here very clearly. In the description of the earthly part, we see the Son. When we go back to chapter 1 and we go to verse 14, we read something very similar to chapter 19 where we are right now. 114 says his head and his hair is white as snow white wool, his eyes like a fiery flame. Okay, that flame. You ever been near fire? It's hot. Verse 18, the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and shawl. He is coming to conquer. <coughs> he is above life. He is above death. Death could not keep him down. He is coming back as that conqueror. Uh, verse 18 identifies from those comments that we're talking about the sun. It's the sun who's coming back judging right now. We're going to read, if we didn't before, then we will in this class. We, I think we did last week, we did, that the Messiah is the judge, that God put into the Messiah's hands the right to judge because it's the pure judging. He is... The, one that they can't say to him, well, you don't know what it's like to be a man. You don't know what it's like to live on that earth. You don't know how hard it was. What you asked was the impossible. He says, no, I lived on that earth. I know what it was to be weary, tired, hungry. You know, he, no one's going to be able to say anything against him. But we do see very clearly these eyes of fire are speaking of God the Son, the one who is returning in chapter 19. And it speaks of righteous judgment against sin. He is calling out sin. He is calling out the evil for what it is. And he has that right. Who is he? Why does he have that right? <laughs> let's go. <laughs> he, let's see, here we are, flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. Diadem, you may have crown. That's another word for crown. The diadem is speaking of the universal conqueror and ruler ruler of the entire world. This is the one coming as king. And the crown he's wearing is not the same word or the same crown that we got crowned with when we stood before him for our rewards. We talked about the crowns that we get as rewards. That in the Greek is the word Stephanus, and that is a victor's crown. And we've been victor in different ways. Some even got the martyr's crown because they lost their life on earth, but God gave them the crown of life. Those are all victor's crowns. They're all Stephanus or Stephanus, however you should say that from the Greek. What we read here is the monarch crown. The monarch crown belongs to the king. Belongs to the king alone. Keep that in mind. We're going to hit king in just a minute, okay? So we have on his head not just one kingly crown. We have many crowns. He is king of kings. And we'll see that in just a moment. We're going to come to that. But before we do, we have that he has a name written on him. He has his name. He is identified. No one's going to guess who he is. They're going to all know he is. But it's interesting. I can't tell you what name he has written on him. Because do you notice that next phrase? It's a name that no one knows. Now, I took you a while back to my new favorite word, <laughs> ineffable, thank you. And we talked about the ineffable name of our God, ineffable, ineffable name. And I'm going to put of the lion because we're seeing him as the lion also. Or you know what, I'll put king because we've got him crowned right now. Okay, the king of kings, I'll spell it all the way out, okay? 
the ineffable name of the King of Kings. Now, we're all curious. As soon as we're told we don't know, we want to know, don't we? <laughs> so we let our minds go and we think. But I, I believe that this name is so above earth that it, it is. It's the ineffable name. It's above any name that we can really grasp fully in our humanity. I think that's why we don't know it. Look at the names that we do know, okay? Um, the deity names that we know, that, that we see him as God and we see him as the Son. We see him glorious. Um, let, me, let me take you to Matthew eleven twenty seven. Let's go there for a minute. Matthew, Matthew eleven twenty seven. We're going to jump around just a little bit. You know me, I don't keep us in one place, but that's because we want all of Scripture to tie together. If you stay in one place, you're going to miss a lot. Matthew 27, and we're going to look at, oops, sorry, Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verse 27, and I did it backwards, so hold on just a second and I'll get there. Matthew 11, chapter 11. Okay, I am challenged. It does not want to go off of it. There we go. Matthew 11, and now verse 27. And we read it there. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son. It's the Son speaking, by the way. Yeshua, Jesus, the Son who is speaking. So he's saying, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son reveals him. What's, what's that saying? Sounds like a riddle, doesn't it? <laughs> what it's saying is, no one really fully knows the Lord. Knew Yeshua. Remember, they were still guessing who he was. He asked his own followers who had been with him three years probably by this point. Who do the people say I am? Oh, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Yohanan the Mercer, John the Baptist. Some say you're a great teacher. Some say you're a great rabbi. Some say you come from God. Who? And he asked them, who do you say I am? And Kepha, Peter, gave an answer that Yeshua then said, Flesh and blood didn't tell you this. You got this from the very Spirit of God. And what did he say? Thou art the, son, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He spoke a mouthful. Messiah, Son of the living God. Wow. And that wasn't even enough. And that's what he was conveying. You've got a name, and you're right. And he, he uh, praises Kiva for learning that from the Ruch HaKodesh and says that he's going to build his church on it, and he does. But he's also just said, but you don't fully know me. Furthermore, the only one who does is God the Father. Why does God the Father know God the Son? Because they're one. That They are the only ones. They're express image. We can't fully get that. The closest we get is identical twins, but they're still two separate people. But if, if they walk alike and talk alike and look alike and think alike, then you get a legal example <laughs> on an earthly level. Only the Father really knows the Son. Only the Son really knows the Father. But the Son came with an intent. He came with the intent to teach us who the Father is. Remember, he didn't come to glorify himself. He said that. I didn't come to do my will. I didn't come for the glory of me. I came for the glory to go to my Father. I came to do his will. I came to point the way home. I came to make the way home. He gave all the glory to the Father. We still don't fully know him. And we still don't fully know the Father. And we won't till we're home. So we have to struggle with a name that we don't even know. And we have to try with the best part of our brains, and believe me, I know how inadequate mine is, to catch hold of this, to grasp hold of who we are talking about. Oh, we're talking about the creator. And I'll stop right there. Not the creator of, the creator of everything. Everything started with him. Without him, there was nothing that even started. No slime, no riverbank, no big bang, nothing. <laughs> and if you're wondering what those words are, that's evolution's way of telling you how this got here. They can't believe in a God who existed and came out of nothing and was always here. But they can believe in a river and a slime bank and a big convention that came together and got smart enough to know how to divide and be male and female and continue to multiply. Wow, that takes more faith. <laughs> Honestly, it does. 
It really does. He's creator. He's creator. I don't understand how to create out of nothing. The best scientists in this world are still trying to do it, and they can't. They get all excited and think that they've made life in a test tube, and they haven't. And they haven't started with nothing. They've started with something. And notice that they only get something weird. They don't get something right. And it's not able to carry on. They can't get to God's level. Right there, this name is the Creator. Wow. If you do create something greater than it, that's why anything you create with your hands is an idol. It's not true and living. It's made out of stones, made out of wood. It's inanimate. He is a creator. <coughs> is that all I want out of this? I think that's all I want out of here. Yeah, okay. Let's go now to Revelation 3.12. Take you right back to the book we're studying so much. And let's see what else about this name. Because we're just beginning to scratch the surface. And, oh, get ready. Because we're not going to finish it. <laughs> First... 12 of chapter 3, speaking to the Church of Philadelphia. Who are we a part of? Are we a part of the Philadelphia Church? Yes. I certainly hope every single one of you are, because there's only two choices today. Philadelphia or Laodicea. Both alive, unfortunately, both well. Well, I can't say that. What I mean well, what I mean is large. Because Laodicea is not well. It thinks it's well. It thinks it's great. It thinks it's seeing. It thinks it's clothed. It thinks it's all this and some, you know, what, bad ships do. And God calls it out. And he brings only condemnation to Laodicea. But he calls Philadelphia, his church is on fire. His church that is interested in missionary work, sending out missionaries, taking the gospel out to the world. This is a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-acting church. This is not a mortar, brick-and-mortar building this is living stones that are being built together to form the house of God that God is a creator of, that Yeshua came to give life to, the abundant life, the eternal life that goes on with him forever. That's what's being described here. And in the Philadelphia church, who he commends and does not condemn, he says, to he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. We're going to see where that temple is in a bit. But right now we know the temple is even within us. We are the temple of the Ruch HaKodesh, Holy Spirit. But he's not going to go out from that temple anymore. He's going to have a place that he is always in the presence of God. That's what's coming and promised to the Philadelphia church, that the ones who overcome. And by the way, how do we overcome? By the blood of the Lord. Okay, that's, that's true, but there's one verse I want. Okay, let me sidetrack you. How do you overcome? What, who is the overcomer? It is through the blood we overcome, but I'm going to use the, the very same words unless this reference does not. Okay. All right, let me get my Bible out. I can't get it off the tablet fast. We want to back up. Remember, Revelation is being written by Yohanan. We're going to stay in Yohanan's own writings, but we're going to go back to 1 John, one of the real little ones right in front of Revelation. Yes, 1 John 5 4. Why my tablet won't do it? That's who the overcomers, yes. And okay, there's my tablet. Okay, we've got it now, both ways. Okay. Because we've just read, to the one who overcomes, you get to be a pillar in the temple of God forever, not leave the, the presence of God anymore. And I mean in reality, where, where we're living with him, okay? Not like we do here where he's in us, because we know he doesn't leave us. But it's the overcomer. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith. That's a verse worth memorizing. I thought I had it, but I froze on you. Get it into your memory. How do you overcome? By your faith. Faith in the Lord. What was that first part? The first part says, born of God. How are you born of God? Through John, 1 John 5, 4. By opening your heart, allowing him to come in, as he said to Nicodemus, you will be born again. And the the picture is 
wonderful because it's like a baby being born that needs to grow up in the Lord. Your faith makes you a child of God. Not anything you actually do because the Spirit puts His faith in you. Okay. All you do is open up and receive the free gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua, Jesus, Christ, Messiah, our Adonai, Lord. Okay? That's what we're told here. So, to the overcomer, to the one who by their faith has overcome. That's us, people. This is our promises. And notice the next part. I will write on him the name of my God. We keep God's name written on us. The name of the city of my God. That's the new Jerusalem, I believe. Might get another name, but it says the new Jerusalem in the next phrase. So I think we're going to have written on us God's name and the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God and my new name. Who's talking? Yeshua is talking. So we've been introduced to his new name all the way back in chapter 3, but how many remember? Because <laughs> we took a long time to get here. But you notice, that's the promise to us. His new name. So, is it any wonder that when we see him coming out of heaven in all his glory, King of Kings, coming back with us, and we're going to cover that part more, that we are wearing his new name name. I think that name has to do with something about that victory. Something more than we have really grasped hold of here. But that's just a guess. I definitely think that it is an attribute of him because that's what all his names are. But I wonder if it's something that's enabled itself to not be ineffable. It is able to contain. And I don't know how, but it's beyond English and it's beyond us. Revelation 14.1 14.1. Oops, we got the right book. Revelation 14.1. And what do we read in 14 and verse 1? Then I looked, Yohanan looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. Remember, these are the ones who are being sealed to carry the gospel out to the ends of the earth during the tribulation. Notice what they have on them. His name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. So this is really not a new thought. But I think we're seeing it on a new level because we are been, we've been up in heaven coming back with him who's wearing his new name. But again, the mystery of our God, of all that he is. You know, some fighting for words still. <laughs> Forgive me, but he's indescribable. He is ineffable. <laughs> he is, it, it, it's a name so wonderful. Oh, wonderful. I've heard that before, Lord. Let's go to Isaiah, Yeshia. Let's keep our good little Jewish minds here because I love Isaiah. He speaks my language. <laughs> and yes, Eric, you're right. Shout it out from the back of the room because you can't contain it. We're going to chapter 9 and verse 6. <laughs> and this is a scripture often brought out at the time that we celebrate his birth into this world. Christmas. We call it Christmas. But we should leave it there. We should have this out all the time. We do that because it starts with for a child will be born to us. Remember, the child is born. That's the humanity side of Yeshua Jesus. That's when God put on a face, slipped into time, put on a face, and we call his name Yeshua Jesus. The son was given because the son was unborn. The son is never born. The son has pre-existed with God before whatever came before what is time. <clears throat> you know, that eternity past that we can't fathom, that we can't wrap our finite brains around because we can't understand being released from time. You know, we talk about it, but we don't understand it. We're bound. He's free. And then notice, the government will rest on his shoulders, on the shoulders of the Son of God. He is going to roll. We're coming into that. As soon as we hit Revelation 20, it's all on, folks. He's rolling. He's reigning. He's coming back to do that now. We're in the first phase of that. His name. You know, we get clues about his name all the way through Scripture. But do you notice how they're always different? Yes. His name is one thing here. It might be 
Adonai here, Lord, Adonai. And then his name might be, let's say, I'll give you my Hebrew, Yehovah Yireh, the Lord our provider. Then his name might be Raphael, the God who heals. We hear all kinds of names all the way through scripture, but his name, his name, his name. Now we've got a new name that we, if this isn't enough, and it's not, <laughs> here comes a new name. But his name here is called Wonderful. Do you know in the Hebrew, the idea behind that word wonderful means it's too difficult to understand? Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, what did I just get told? He's got a name that no one knows. Is it because it's too difficult to understand? Yes. So is Yeshaya and Yochanan talking the same language? Yes. Are they both teaching us that we've got a mighty Lord God? Wow. Yes. Wow, yes, yes. his name is wonderful. Then you can put it together because the Hebrew does not put a comma in between. He's the wonderful counselor. Yes. Is that only? is amazing also. Is it one only? It's, it's couplets, which means that we can divide and see them separate, but it does come together. So it is wonderful counselor, and then the next two is my God, and the next two, eternal father, actually, um, and then we have prince of peace. But, but we see them coupled in the Hebrew. But I like to do them on both levels because I believe both is right. He is wonderful. He is too hard to comprehend. He's too indescribable. He's too great. He can't be contained. I want to put that whole ocean in my teacup and it's running over. <laughs> it's not working. But he's also my wonderful counselor. You ever need counseling? Yeah. I think I do daily, Lord. Yes. Aren't I nagging you daily, Lord? God, give me wisdom. Lord, God, counsel me. Lord, God, let me walk in the counsel of your mind. Let me hear your voice. He's the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. And this is El Gabor. This is all powerful. Hero God, mighty God. Take your Superman and throw kryptonite at him and see he's human. Now give me my mighty God and yes. nothing can come at him. Yes. Nothing at all falls short. He's mighty God. He is eternal Father. Do you know from the Hebrew that's really Father of Eternity? That is how we understand He created eternity. He gave birth to eternity. He was before eternity. How are you before eternity? I don't get it, God. <laughs> it's okay, my little child. Just have faith. <laughs> Just have faith. You're not going to get it, because if you could, then I'm on your level. Oh, thank God he's not. So he is the eternal father, the father of eternity. And because he's the father of eternity, not just that past, he's the father of my future. Look what I put up here today. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. That's where my safety is, that's where my security is, that's where my shalom is. And if you get my eyes off of him, I'm lost, I'm floundering, I'm done. But he's not, because he's faithful. Remember, he's faithful and he's righteous. Oh, I wanted to bring out something new on righteous. Someone remind me to come back to that later. Don't let me forget, because I got a new thought on that this week. Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. What does this world cry out for? Peace. Shalom. Peace. It needs the peace of God. It's the only way it will have peace. That is who he is. That is his name. If I ask you your name, you can give me a first name. And then you can give me a last name. And you're both of those, aren't you? Well, that's what he is. Only he's got so many names in between. <laughs> the first and the last. That that makes me think of the all from the top. The Hebrew for A to Z. He's A. He's Z. He's before A. He's after Z. He is incapable. He is mighty. He is hero God. He is wonderful. He is counselor. He is prince of peace. He is my God. My king. My savior. My redeemer. My Lord. Wow. Yes. How that? Yes. Ah, I've just begun, folks. <laughs> I've just begun. Let's take it all that in our minds. Let's go back to Revelation 19. Let's look a little further at what's around here where it's talking about his new name. Where it's showing him coming back in that glory, in that power of his name, of who he is. 
uh, the one who is faithful, the one who is true. Let me tell you righteousness too, okay? Because we, we um, have that in verse 11. He is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges. Go real quick with me, just sidetrack for a moment, Romans 1, 16 and 17. These verses, especially 16, have always been dear to my heart. It was my dad's favorite verse. It was his mantra for his entire life once he got saved. And it's carried on in his daughter because God has blessed me to carry on the ministry. That was both my folks. Romans 1, 16 and 17. And yes, it's not down in your cross-references because I was reading it for another reason. And because I'm studying the righteousness of God, it jumped off. Out of the page. I love that. You know how scripture can do that? You've read it a hundred times and here comes something new. Keep righteousness in mind and look at it. I am not ashamed. This is all Paul talking. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah. Remember when you see Christ in English? Put in Messiah because that's the word in Hebrew. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Messiah for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek or it means to the Gentile and here's where it jumped off for in it, in the power of God that saves, in it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written and you have there the just shall live by faith but the meaning from the root, from the original is Romans 1, 16 and 17 the, the original thought here is the just out of his faith shall live. Mm. Wow. What's that faith? The righteousness of God. What's the power? The righteousness of God. What's up to us? Nothing. We just live in it. He born us into his family. It is by faith. Remember what overcomes? Our faith. Faith in what? The righteousness of our God expressed in his name. He is righteousness. He is God. Now, do you remember verse 7 of chapter 19? Go back. Look up. I don't, yeah, I'm still in the right. Look up chapter, um, our chapter, verse 7. We are getting married, remember? Right. We put on a wedding gown. What was the wedding gown? Fine linen. It's right and clean. White and pure. What's that fine linen? The righteousness. The righteous acts, but the righteousness of the saints. What righteousness? My righteousness? Look what I did. Look at how beautiful I am. <laughs> My righteousness is as filthy rags. Yeshia, Isaiah 64, 6. But that's what we're clothed in. We're clothed in his name. Do you get that? He puts his name on you. I got a lot of girls in this class. How many of you are married? How many of you took on your husband's name when you got married? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Marriage, Supper of the Lamb? Mm -hmm. We took on the name of our bridegroom, the name of our husband, this ineffable name. We're not worthy of it, but he clothes us in his name. He clothes us in his power. He clothes us in his glory. He clothes us in his mightiness and his majesticness. Wow! <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Somebody give me a better vocabulary. There isn't one. No, it's indescribable. But ineffable. But I want you to catch that because we've come through the horrors. Even though we, as a people, will not live through the tribulation, you've had trials. You've had tribulations. If I asked you if you were in one right now, I'll bet you every hand would go up. Because the Christian life is either going into a trial, in a trial, or coming out of a trial. So if you're new in the, this life, get used to it, folks, because that's what it is. It's not freedom from trials, but it's the power of God to go through those trials. Whatever is on your heart right now, wrap it up in his name, and you'll have all you need. Yes, that name is mighty. That name is strong. That name is powerful. That name is wonderful. Wonderful counselor. Great God, eternal father, prince of peace. That name is faithful and true. That name is righteous. And then there's a new name that he's wearing above all of these other names. Oh my goodness. 
how can we begin to contain and get a brain ache? <laughs> look at it in here, okay? Let's look at verses 13 through 16. We're going to come back to them also, but I just want to carry our thoughts through about how wonderful his name is. That, you know what, let me just jump all around, okay? In verse 11, we saw faithful. We've already talked about that one. Um, I'm going to say reliable also, because faithful is reliable. It, it, you can count on it, you can take it to the bank. And I've told you before, when Faith goes to market, she carries a basket. She doesn't go with nothing to put in. She's going to buy, she's going to receive, she's going to get. And by the way, God's market has no checkout. <laughs> you just take and go. <laughs> you don't pay. <laughs> okay, so. We also see the revelation of his name. Look at verse 13. He's clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and here's his name. Okay, we got a name again. His name is the Word of God. Okay, that's the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the Word of God. Hmm, Yochanan, what are you saying? Do I remember another one of your books? Your first book, yeah. the yeah. first words you wrote. Yeah. I love it. I see the lights coming on. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's that name, the Word of God. That's his name also. If I started writing down every name, I'd run out of whiteboard space, and I wouldn't begin to contain our our Lord, our Savior. So verse 13, we see the revelation that he is the Word of God. Verse 16, we see he's royal. And I love it. And I can't wait to get there. Because what does it say at the end of verse 16? Mine has it in capital letters. King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you know what that says? He's above. He's above. Whoever you've got on your ladder, he's above. He's above every king. He's above all the kings. He's above everyone that's given the name Lord. He's above them. He is king of all kings, lord of all lords. He is maj maj majesty on high. In our Hebrew is Elohim Haim, most high God. That's who we're talking about here. This is his name. Okay, so we see the revelation of his name. We see he's reliable. He's faithful. We see he is the word of God. We see he is royal. We saw he is righteous. We saw that he is all-seeing. He recognizes his omniscient. He knows. We see he's ruling. He's king. He's lord. Go to, go to England. The queen rules. What the queen says goes. You know what? She's queen. He's king. <laughs> and if you put a king on the throne in England, he's still king of kings. I don't care who you put there from all time. No matter who. He... <laughs> Let me take you back to that wonderful name. Let me take you to the Hebrew of it, Pella. Pella also has in that root that it's a miraculous thing. It's astonishingly. That's the I wonder. Wonderful. That's Pella. P E L E. That's that's what it is. It comes off of the root of P A L A. And P A L A, Paula, is miraculous. Miraculous. So I've given you everything. I've shown you all of these. I've given you. Ruling, reigning, righteous, royal, um, faithful. Uh, I'm looking through my notes to get all these names, but above all of that, his name is miraculous. Hallelujah. His name is off the charts. His name is off the page. Yes. Do you know what a miracle is? Can you define a miracle? <laughs> Don't you love it? I'm sorry. If I'm staying here too long, let me gloat in his name. Let me just bathe in his name. Because in his name is his glory. And we have seen him suffering. We have seen him servant. We have seen him abused, misused, and mistreated. I want to see him. Rain. I want to see him 
get what he deserves. I want to see every knee bow at the name of my God. I want to see him receive his glory that is long overdue by all of creation. Everything under this earth, in this earth, over this earth, all of heaven. Remember, heaven's been praising him, but it's going to go past heaven. And it's coming out, and I think we're shouting his praises. We're behind our King of Kings, the Lord of the Lord, saying, go, go, go. We're not coming back to battle with him. He's going to do all the battling. We're going to see that in a moment. He's going to be the one that you see the blood on. We're white. We're pure. We're clean. He doesn't need us. We just get to come back and be part of his entourage. Get to see it. Get to see him. We're his observers. We get to say, yes, finally. My God's name has been stepped on far too long. Years ago, my brother's in high school. He's got a girlfriend that's just not anybody that you would think would be willing to be in the center of attention and take the stage. That's not her personality. She's very glad to just blend in. She's riding the public bus. I don't know if you've all, and then let me grab one, if you've seen my dad's testimony tract or not. My dad gave these out by the thousands. I still have the privilege of giving them out. Ah. Oh, I do. One English one left. I had it in Spanish. From a hopeless end and endless hope tells his story, how he went from Orthodox Judaism to knowing that Jesus, Yeshua, the one we're talking about, is his Messiah and his Savior. It's all contained in a few little pages. She gets on the public bus system, and somebody had gotten one of those tracks. Who knows how, because like I say, they were being passed out all the time. Mm -hmm. They were making fun of it, and they started throwing it around back and forth on the bus and laughing at the track. They're laughing at Jesus. Oh. She finally had all she could take. Bless her heart. It landed in the aisle near her seat. And Lil, and I won't say the name for the sake of video, but this little gal went, picked it up, dusted it off, and said, it's a shame they walk all over my Jesus. And wow. sat back down. She said the whole bus went quiet. <laughs> the whole bus. She took a stand for him. But you know what? His name has been trampled too long. Why am I not wanting to move off of this? Because finally, finally, he's being put up on the throne where he belongs. He is being honored and he is being seen in his Shekhinah glory, the glory of God. He is finally beginning to get what he should have all along. The respect, the beautiful. I'm hours. I'm hours. I'm I'm silence. That's my God. That's my Lord. That's His name. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise to our God. He yes. is coming. And let's see how He comes now. We've got to move off His name. You want to add? Yes. I want to have. Um, I was reading Revelation back in. Um, chapter 1 verse 9 and this is when John uh, said he's, he went through the tribulation for the word of God and then he says for the testimony of Jesus can you explain that just that brief for the word of God and the testimony okay last week in our class we saw that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy that means that all words, prophetic words, the words of God, and prophecy is either foretelling or foretelling. The difference being foretelling is something that will be in the future. Foretelling is something that's already. That's all scripture. It's either foretelling or foretelling about our Lord. The spirit of prophecy, everything is all focused on Yeshua Jesus, on his either coming first time, coming second time. It's either looking to the cross or looking back to the cross. The testimony of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. How did it say in verse 9? It says the word of Jesus. The testimony, the proposition is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, the testimony of Jesus. So that's your testimony of Jesus, okay? Um, and I'm going to Revelation 1 9, so I don't have to keep asking you. Okay. Um, 1 verse 9? Yeah, 1 9. 
Okay, that's a different version. Let me go to, to this one where I can see it. Okay, so, and remember in this description, this is God the Father and God the Son, so united we can't really separate them. Yeah, there it is, okay, in the king uh, at the end, okay, for the word of God and for the testimony, okay, I jump to your second, for the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah. Remember verse 1 says, this is the revelation of Yeshua, Messiah. Yeah, Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, okay, so. The whole, the, the, this whole thing is to reveal him in his glory. We've talked about that before. We didn't have revelation. We wouldn't have him coming back in his glory. We'd only have the servant side. We wouldn't have the reigning side that we're getting now. So the testimony of Yeshua, of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. It is the word of God being fulfilled, past, present, future. It is the testimony of the fact that he is God and he is the only way to God. All of that, everything that you want to add to that, that you that we believe, all goes into the testimony of Yeshua Jesus. He came to glorify his Father. He came to make the way to his Father. If he did not come, we would not be heaven bound. We cannot make it to heaven apart from his coming to earth and being human and God at the same time and taking care of our sin problem for us. So there's your testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach. And if I had more time, I'm sure I'd give you more because I just wanted to differentiate like the, the word of God, the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yes, the word of God. We take it when we say it. We say that that um, when we preach the word of God, we're giving out the very word of God. We say that that we're <laughs> we're telling the testimony of God. Okay, but I think it's even deeper than that. I think it's what I just took you to in Yohanan John one one. Okay, the word of God is very God Himself. So when he says in verse 9 here that uh, this is for the word of God, this is, this, how do I say it? How do I bring it? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So the word of God is Yeshua from the beginning. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He's the savior. We see all of that in that one word. The Trinity. In that. Well, you do see the Trinity because the Spirit of God moved over the face of the earth in creation. God and, and Yeshua are the two names given that created. We have scripture that says God created and scripture that says Yeshua Jesus created. We know both are right because they're both in one. And the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the earth was working out the creation that God and Yeshua were creating. Okay. That kind of falls short because, again, we're trying to do heavenly on earthly terms. We're trying to do infinite into finite. We're trying to do an ocean into a teacup. <laughs> it's just not going to happen on a level that's perfect. But I think that's the closest we can get. So the word of God, the very word, he spoke and it came into existence. He spoke and it was done. That's from beginning to end. He spoke and it happens. He speaks and it happens. So the word of God is is Yeshua, and the Word of God is everything. It's, it's um, how do I put it? It's all in all. All in all. Yeah. Good. Thank you. That's good. That's very good. I like that. Verse, all in all. Uh, verse 13, uh, the Word of God is... Praise the Lord. I was praying. In verse 13, the Word of God is capitalized. And I just realized in 1-9, it's not capitalized. So... Okay, the capitalization is going to come down to human factor. Let okay. me remind you of that. Um, okay. In 13, you should have the Son of Man. I don't have Word of God in 13. I have Son of Man. And that is capital S because we're talking about Deity Son. We're not talking about... So, when 13, you have it not capitalized? When 9. Okay. Oh, when 9, the Word of God is not? Okay. Um, I'd have to go back to my notes and see if there's anything more that I would say there. Um, the Word of God, there's no way around the fact that the Word of God is God. It's also the, the word printed on the page that speaks of God, you know, in, in a, a way that's alive. Um, I think they should have capitalized it. Yes. Part of my Bible, it says here, Yeshua fulfills three main offices set forth in the Tanuk, prophet, priest, and king. Yes. During the life on earth, Yeshua served as a prophet, 
and that was in Matthew. At present, he serves as a high priest in heaven. That was in Hebrews. And this is significant by him wearing a long robe and gold band around his chest. Yes. Yes. And keep going. Does it give you the third part? Uh, yeah, I'm looking for that. The clothing and the high, high priest. High priest is going to be, and I'll put high here, it's going to be, and we do see it, Book of Hebrews, especially. As Messianic King. Yes. Very good. Very good. I like your footnote. Is that the complete Jewish Bible, the state Bible? Yes. That's why it's so good. <laughs> um, and what did they do? Matthew for the prophet? I think they did Matthew, did they not? Is that not the example they gave when they yes, said prophet? Matthew. Okay. Uh, the last ones, the, the two last ones are in Revelation 1 and 1, uh, Judge Messianic King, and Matthew is 21-11. Okay, if you want to get specific verses, but I'm going to tell you all of Matthew, you see him as prophet, because he's yeah. fulfilling the prophecies. He came as the prophet of God who fulfills all the prophecies. This is key. We see this all the time through Scripture. What we never see in one is priest and king, with one exception. That's Melchizedek, Melchizedek, which means my God is king. And he was a forerunner or a type of who Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus is. Because until you come out of Yeshua, you have the priests come from what tribe? Judah. 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 Priests? The oh, Levi. 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 The Levites had the priests. The king comes from Judah. Okay? But you see, and by the way, Melchizedek, we don't know if he was an actual person or if he was what's called a Christophany, which means he took on human form before the, before the Lord was born in human form. Um, because of one scripture in particular that says like and doesn't say he is, I think, okay, that maybe he wasn't. Otherwise, everything I think I would say he was a Christophany. So I'm like 99% in the Christophany category, but I've got one verse that I don't know how to make it fit in. But yet the one verse is not enough to throw all of this off. So whichever way, it does not matter. He either was an actual, um, almost perfect picture of, or he was a Christophany. Okay, but our priests always came from the tribe of Levi. We see Abraham offering tithes to him as king and as priest. What we see in Yeshua is he is of the tribe of Judah in his human, uh, he was, you know, David's son. David comes from Judah, the tribe of Judah. But we see in his role that he is our high priest. Book of Hebrews, where's my Hebrew students? One word that describes Hebrews, everything Hebrews talks about, it is that's Daniel. That's Daniel. That's good too. Oh, Hebrews, the, the word that, that describes Hebrews, everything in Hebrews that he talks about is better. Better. Yay, I knew I'd get a student out of here yet. <laughs> better. Hebrews talks about the priests, talks about the high priest, but it directs you to the better high priest. Hebrews talks about the sacrifice, but it talks about the better sacrifice. Hebrews talks about the house of God, but it's the better house of God. Now let me tell you how. The house of God that Moshe built was built by Moshe, but the house that, would, that God is building, he not only builds it, he fills it. Okay? He not only was priest, he not only was high priest, but he was the perfect high priest. The high priest before the book of Hebrews is describing Yeshua, they're human. They die. Sometimes you had a good high priest, sometimes you had an honorary high priest. Sometimes you had a high priest that was really godly, and sometimes you had a high priest that God had to take to task. They were human. They had to make sacrifices for themselves, and then they went on and made sacrifices for the people. The book of Hebrews, especially 8, 9, and 10, is going to talk about the high priest who goes in not with the blood of bulls and goats. He goes in with his own blood. Amen. He takes that blood through the heavenlies. He places it on the heavenly mercy seat, and he procures salvation forever. And he is the eternal high priest. Yes, he died. He didn't stay dead. He resurrected. He, in the resurrection power, claimed that victory over that death, and he is a high priest that goes on forever. There is never another high priest. 
We don't need another high priest. We don't need another sacrifice. He is the Finish. best, the better. So we see him as high priest. We know that he is king because of his tribe and because we even see here he's being crowned king of kings, the Lord of lords. We know that this is what is claimed for him. This is the coming together. And this is another name that I want to introduce you to. Okay, we'll do purple. That's royal. <laughs> this is a name that if you've been around me, you've heard a lot. Samak. Samak, you hear me talk about our ministry head name, Samak Global Alliance, when we're talking about the, the world, when we're talking about the church with local, we talk about Samak Christian Alliance. But Samak is a common, the Samak is a name that is in both. Samak is the name that is above it all. When Pastor Gil and I were coming together and forming the uh, relationship of ministry that we have together, we needed a name. We're trying different things, we're bouncing different ideas off of each other, and I love the way God works. Because all of a sudden, literally at the very same moment in time, I come at it from the Hebrew, and he came at it in the English. And he starts to say to me, what do you think about, and I hear him say, the branch, when I said, Samach. And I looked at him and I said, that's what Samach means. And we both lit up on fire. We knew we had our name. Samach means the branch. Now, there's more to it than just the branch. This is the branch that springs forth and fills the face of the earth. This is the branch that is high priest and king. Now, where do I get that? Go with me to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. And these are our key verses that our whole ministry is founded on. 6, 12, and 13. In 6, 12, and 13, he says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, Adonai Sabaot. The Lord of hosts is speaking, saying, Behold the man whose name is Samach, whose name is the branch. He shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he, Zechariah 6, 12 and 13, even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory. He shall sit and rule upon his throne, there's your king, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. Wait a minute, God. The priests don't sit on thrones. Mm -mm. <laughs> they do when they're my high priest, my king, my God, the one who is above all, when it's not the earthly high priest, and it's not the earthly king, but it is the king of kings, and the high priest of all priests, when it is the one that Mel Melchizedek, my king is righteous, is representing, now you have the branch. He sits and rules on his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council, remember wonderful counselor? The council of peace, of shalom, shall be between them both, between the high priest who gives us our peace from our sins and our king who gives us the righteousness in all ruling, rules, judge, rules and judges fairly, faithfully, truthfully, there we have our shalom, because when we're dealt with in justice and in truth, there is shalom. It's all brought together in his name. This is the branch that springs forth and fills the face of the earth. This is the branch, if you went to Isaiah 11.1, 1, the root of Jesse that springs forth. This is a miraculous filling of the face of the earth. And when he sits on that millennial throne on earth, all of earth, he is king of kings over. All of earth. Every knee is going to bow at his name. He is going to fill the face of this earth with his glory. Because it can't be contained. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> I need some more sound effects. In this. <laughs> Yes. It's amazing how all of these things fit together because the branch 
Okay. Yeshua is the branch. Yes. We are the vine. Yes. God is the yeah. Yeah. When, Yes. When you hear I'm the vine and you are the branches, remember that's a, a similarity. That's not talking about the branch. The branches that feed off of that vine have to be fed by that vine. You cut the vine, the branches all dry up. But when you take that into our picture of the, the tree, then we do have exactly what you said, the root. What comes out of the root is the trunk. That's the root is Yeshua. The trunk is what he comes through, branches out. The branches are fed by staying in that trunk, by drinking the roots that come through. That's your Judeo-Christianity. That's seeing the bud and the flower come out of it. You have to have both. If you take away Judaism, you lose the foundation that Christianity was laid on top of because it was a precursor. It was prophetic. It was to be fulfilled. It was never to be left alone. It was to be fulfilling. The Jewish nation was to carry the word of God to the world. It was the way for the Gentiles to be saved was to come in through it. And when they let down and did not carry out, that's when God finally said, okay, I'll set you aside for a time, Israel. I'm going to provoke you to jealousy. I'm going to give what you don't want to the Gentiles. And when you see them with it, Hopefully you can get good and jealous. <laughs> Wait a minute, that was mine and I want it back. Okay, well then come on in. <laughs> you can have it too. Because I'm Jewish in the Gentile time that's saved. I'm not left out because I'm Jewish. The Gentiles weren't left out because they were Gentiles. They came into the Jewish race that was a pre-picture of. Now we're on that equal footing. We come in together, Jew and Gentile, <laughs> Ephesians 2, Ephesians 4, 2, 4. Which one? Ephesians 2, the one you have or 4? <laughs> the brain is tired. I think it's 2. I think it's 2. Okay, yes. Ephesians 2, 11. Wherefore remember, you, being in the past, Gentiles in the flesh, most of you in front of me right now, who were called uncircumcision by those who were called circumcision in the flesh made with hands. So the Jewish people who literally circumcised because that was the covenant sign that God made with the people when he cut a covenant, it was shown by circumcision. That was the, the cutting. If they did not circumcise their son, he was cut off from the commonwealth of Israel. He would not receive the blessings of Israel. That was critical. That's why when the enemy would not allow them to circumcise their children out in captivity, it tore at their heart because they thought that their children would be losing out on those blessings. But that was done with hands. That was done physically. Now he's saying it's something more than that. That was a cutting with the flesh made by hands. And at that time, you who were without the Messiah, you were being aliens. You were, you were outside of that commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. The Gentiles had no hope. They didn't have the true living God. They had idols. I don't care who they worshipped. I don't care what time period. I don't care what name you put on it. It was dead. It was a stone. It was wood. It was whatever they made it out of. It was dead. There was no living God that they were praying to. There was no living God they were sacrificing to. And that's horrible also. But they had nothing. They had no hope. They were without God in the world. But now, in Messiah Yeshua, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off are made near by the blood of Messiah. When he shed that blood, he brought the Gentiles in like a flood. You could, you could just literally put yourself on his blood and flow in and realize you're flowing right into the presence of God now through his blood, the very same way the Jewish person does also. And then he tells us in Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 31, that it's a circumcision of the heart, that he'll take out that stony heart and he'll put in a heart of flesh. It's the circumcision of the heart that matters. Not the cutting of hand, what the hands can cut physically, but what God cuts spiritually when you come in a covenant with God. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, yes. All of that contained in his name, in the branch, in the one who is the high priest and king of kings. 
the verse I just quoted was Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. Start with about 31 and read on. It's the new covenant. Yes. Yes. And 35 on tells you that God's not done with Israel. Don't ever believe that lie. It's out of the pit of hell. It's called replacement theology and may it go back to the pit of hell. God does not hold back on his promises when he said, I will, unconditionally, I will. Then he does. He does. If he could change on Israel, he could change on us that are called Christians today. Because we're told the same thing. I will. I will. He doesn't say, you have to do your part. You get saved by the blood, now go out and work for it. Or work your way to be good enough for it. No. It's simply and totally on him. We don't add to it, and we can't take away. We don't save ourselves, and that's why we can't lose ourselves either. Amen. 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 Okay, well, we've gotten out of his name. <laughs> and we didn't even begin to scratch the surface. But may this all bless you. And I, I did add this in because we're seeing him now. We have seen him as high priest in that first coming. Now we're seeing him in the kingly role, king of kings, coming back to rule and reign. And yet he's one. And because he is of the tribe of Judah, he has the physical right to the throne. But because he is son of God, he has the spiritual right. Because God is king of kings and lord of lords. No matter what, no matter who, no matter what name, he is above all. He is greater than all. He is awesome and he is amazing. And we've got him judging with his eyes a flame of fire, wearing the, the king's crown. His name is written on him that no one knows but himself. And I'm sure he's going to reveal that to us because when we're finally conformed to his image, now we'll be able to understand. And I think we're just going to be in awe. I think we're going to say, no wonder you couldn't get that down to that puny little brain down there. This is our God. And now notice he is clothed, verse 12, with a robe dipped in blood. Okay, or a vesture you may have dipped in blood. Okay, it's, it's got blood all over it. Remember, he's in white also. He's on the white horse and he's in white because white speaks of righteousness and truth. But we see blood on him. Why? How is he like that? Is this defilement? What is this? Of course, it's not defilement. Our God cannot be defiled. But let's go to Isaiah, Yeshia. And let's find out why he's got blood on him. I think you all know, but let's go ahead and read it anyway. We're going to go to Isaiah 63. Isaiah chapter 63, and we will pick up at verse 1, right in the beginning. <coughs> Yeshia, Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom? And remember, Edom is on the right side and going down south. Uh, it's where Petra is and other areas. It's Moab. All that was part of Edom. Jerusalem's over here, south and east of Israel. Who comes from Edom? Comes with garments, glowing colors from Bozrah. Bozrah is another name in that area. This one who is majestic in his apparel. We've got someone majestic coming here. Marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. What have we just been reading? He is righteousness. He is truth. He is the one able to save. Remember El Gabor, the Almighty God? All of this in this. We know who we're talking about. Only one can claim to be this. Only the Lord God himself can claim to be this. And then the question is asked, why is your apparel red? Why are your garments like the one who treads in the wine press? Remember, they would stomp out grapes. What color are grapes? Red. Red, purple, crimson. If you're wearing white and you're stomping grapes, anybody see I Love Lucy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she gets cover, doesn't she? Okay. You're not going to have a white garment white very long. I had a little guy when I taught school that his mommy sent him out. This is summertime when all they get to do is play all day. He's, she buys him the cutest little racing outfit, shorts. 
white with just a little bit of pinstripe color. And I saw that at 7 in the morning and I thought, oh my word, on this little guy, this is not going to be white at the end of the day. <laughs> he left it like ours in the dirt. And when he was done at the end of that day, his mom came to pick him up. She took one look at him and she said, what did you do? And I looked at mom and I said, what he does every day. He plays in the dirt. <laughs> well, the Lord isn't playing and it's not dirt, but it's blood. And it is splattered on him. His garments are red like one who's been treading the wine press. And he says, I have trodden the wine trough alone. Okay, Alone. We're not worthy of that. He is the one worthy to call them out. From the peoples, there was no man with me. From the peoples, there was no man with me. I trod them in my anger. I trampled them in my wrath. What is the tribulation? Remember when the cup came full and he said, enough is enough and I'm pouring out my wrath on yeah. man who has denied me. Not man who has accepted me. He has taken us out of the way before he's poured his wrath out. But this wrath is deserved. Justice, righteousness, fair and true. Their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments. I stained all my raiment, for the day of vengeance was in my heart. My year of redemption has come. Okay, he has come straight out of that battlefield where he has been splattered with their blood. That's what we're seeing. It said that, that he uh, treaded the winepress. Look at Revelation 14. We'll keep this and see we're talking about the same time. We keep things in context. We use scripture to interpret scripture. Go with me to Revelation chapter 14 and look at verse 19. And remember when we were in 14, we were talking about the battle of Armageddon, were we not? We had the, the, the doom of those who were worshiping the beast. We saw it. They took his name. They are condemned. In verse 14, we looked, and behold, no. hello, are you awake? Are you paying attention? Yeah. Remember, behold, 33 times in the book of Revelation, and it's God's way of saying, hey, don't miss this, okay? <laughs> Behold, a white cloud sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man. Now, I think it's actually one who is the son of man, but Yochanan is seeing him look like the son of man. He doesn't know everything yet. Why? Because he has the golden crown. 14, 14. 14, 14. 14, 14. He has the golden crown on his head. What did we just read in 19? The crown is on his head. What else does he have? A sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap. That sickle, whoosh, and it cuts off all of whatever it has been in its path. It's either cutting down the wheat or if it's trampling the, the grapes, it's cutting out. It is, in this case, the bloody scene. That is what we are seeing. The hour to reap has come. The harvest of the earth is ripe. And remember we saw that ripe? It was ready to explode. And it was not a good ripe. It was like an overdue ripe. This is the rotting. This is when you see that fruit that has passed its season. And it is disgusting. And it just, it's ready to explode. And if it explodes, it just shoots that ugh, all over. And it, it tastes horrible. It's not good and sweet in the mouth. It wasn't something that was good. He was cutting out the evil. That is what we're seeing in chapter 14. We went through this. We knew this was Armageddon. He who sat on the clouds swung his sickle over the earth. The earth was reaped. When does the whole earth suffer tribulation? At the time of the tribulation. We've had the Holocaust. We've had the Crusaders. We've had horrors at different times. We've had tsunamis wipe out villages and people. We've seen devastation on devastation. But we're talking the whole earth. The whole earth. Remember when we looked at Revelation 3.10? I know that's a long time ago. But it talked about what was going to come on the whole earth. Let me read it to you real quickly because we were there earlier today. Revelation 3.10. To the church of Philadelphia, because you have you've kept the word of my patience. And by the way, word is not capitalized here either. But we know the word is the word of God. We know it is very thought of south. Because you have kept the word, I will also keep the from the hour of temptation. Now remember my little mouse in my box? I should have brought that today. I brought my chart and I haven't used it and I didn't bring my mouse. <laughs> but if you take a mouse, you drop it in the box, 
Now, when you want to look at English prepositions, is everything that mouse can do in relation to that box is your preposition, and every word is different. So if I tell you the mouse is in the box, is in the box, what can I do? I can't dump anything in here because I've got water in here, but if I put the pen in the cup, it's in the cup. If it's over the cup, it's over the cup. If it's under the cup, it's under the cup. If it's around the cup, it's around the cup. If he says, I will keep you from, then he's keeping you from. The Greek tells us, he keeps us from the edge up. That give you the idea we get mighty close? We get mighty close, but we're kept away from. Okay, and he says, I kept you away from uh, the hour of temptation or the hour of tribulation which shall come upon all the world. Just a few minutes ago, Ruth gave us all in all. What does all mean? All. all. <laughs> the bad definition is when you use your word in the definition, so we'll take everything from Ruth, but we'll still say all is all, and that's all that all means, <laughs> okay? So it's going to come over all the earth. So, to the victims in the Holocaust who said, God, are we in the tribulation? No, you're not. Are you in a tribulation? Yes. Are you in the tribulation? No. It's not on the face of the whole earth. It's not following revelation. It's not even started in the right way, where a peace treaty is made by one who is looking to be... Wonderful, but he's not. Nothing similar. No matter what you've gone through, no matter how bad it was, it was a tribulation. And it, I don't take that word lightly, but it wasn't the tribulation that you're promised to be kept from. And it goes on and it says, that comes on the whole world, to try them, to test them who dwell on the earth. And we saw in another version it made it very clear. It didn't say to them who dwell on earth, it said to the earth dwellers. It means the same thing, doesn't it? Okay? You, who are believers in Yeshua, where is your citizenship? Heaven! Perfect answer. You are not an earth dweller. This is not your home. You're just a passing through, as the song says. We are citizens in heaven. Heaven is our earthly home. Those who are earth dwellers are those who do not have the Lord as their Savior. That's who the trial, the tribulation, the tribulation comes on. Remember, it's the unrighteousness. It's filled the cup. It's deserving of justice being served. It is a holy God not being able to wink or look away at sin. He has to call it out. He has to judge it. What does that have to do with us? Nothing. Am I condemned in God's sight? No. No. Am I an earth dweller in God's sight? No. no. Do I deserve his wrath? No. Why not? Because I've been so good. I've lived a good life. I've gone to church on a weekend. I've been born in a Christian country. I've never hurt my neighbor. I've, I've done many good deeds. None of that. Garbage. Worse. Throw it away. Don't even start all over again because i got nothing to start with. But because I am lost in the blood of Yeshua, has put his blood over me, he has clothed me in his righteousness, he has married me to him. Even though we haven't consummated that marriage yet, because we won't till I'm home, till the son brings me home. Remember, he's building my home. But anything I need, he's taking care of my needs because I'm betrothed to him. Once I'm home, I get to be the bride and have my wedding feast. But he's <coughs> keeping me from the wrath that he's pouring out because I don't deserve it anymore. I did in my sin. I did in my apartness from him. But I'm at one with him. Remember atonement? At one moment. It's not really what the word is, but it sure is what it means. If you don't get it, at one meant and you put it all together without the dashes and you have the word atonement 
When you see the word atonement in Hebrew, you have the word kapor. Kapor or kapor. Ah, sometimes it's put with an A on the end. That is, sorry? That's like Yom Kippur. The Yom Kippur. Very good. The Day of Atonement is the blood of the bulls and goats. It is the high priest offering the blood of a bull for himself first. Then he has the two goats. The one is the scapegoat. He, the lot's fallen on that one to go out and be banished out of the wilderness. Picture of our sin taken away, never seen again. The other is sacrificed. His blood is taken by that high priest into the mercy seat, into the place where atonement can be had. The high priest has gone in once a year, put that blood on that seat to show at one moment with God through shed blood, all a picture of Messiah. That high priest strips down his linen breeches. He goes in humble. He goes in in white, but humble in that white. He goes in, he offers the blood. Don't believe the fable that, that he had the bells on and they'd hear the bells and if they didn't hear the bells he had a rope around his ankle so that he could pull them out. All of my dad's religious books from Judaism, not one tells that to be truth, okay? He's not wearing the robe that has the bells on it anyway, so there goes that theory right there. But he goes in and the people watched. I imagine there was a quietness over that whole camp when he would go in to offer the blood for the people. Will God accept their sacrifice? He puts the blood on the mercy seat just as God told him. He's just asked for forgiveness for himself, so he's going in as pure as he can make himself to be. But he still needs that blood also. So he's representing himself and the people. Puts the blood on the mercy seat. And the next time the people see him, he comes out and he's put on his regalia again, and he's in his glory again. What did Messiah do? He was stripped down bare. He gave his blood. He took that blood and miraculously took it up to heaven because we read when he resurrected, and we know he was in the heart of the earth, in Sheol, in paradise for the three days, not in hell. He was in paradise. He told the thief on the cross, today I will be with you in paradise. And don't believe those who say that. It says, verily, verily, I say unto you today, period. Period. You'll be with me in paradise. That's not true. That's a misrepresentation of the Greek, which I can read and I have looked, and there is no period, there's no comma, there's no nothing in there. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise was in the heart of the earth. That's where he was for three days. He resurrects. He is on his way to his father because he says he's going to go to his father. He tells Miriam, who he has stopped, and I love this. She's at the tomb bawling her head off. <laughs> the Lord stops out of his love for her, I think. And he comforts her. But when she wants to cling to him, she tells him, he tells her, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my Father in heaven. Then a little later, we see that he's seen by a number and he lets them cling to him. So obviously something has happened. He took, miraculously took his blood, put it on the mercy seat. Now remember, the last time they saw him, they saw him crucified. They saw him dead. They couldn't comprehend it. They scattered. They blew all over. Thomas takes off and people fault him. I don't. That poor guy had his head twisted. We've got scripture. We've got everything to tell us the whole story. They're living through it. They're trying to catch on. They're trying to understand. When Yeshua had told them in the beginning of Matthew 24 that the temple was going to be destroyed, wait a minute, Lord. You're talking about destruction. What about your coming kingdom? When are you going to rule and reign? They didn't get it because they weren't understanding the sacrifice that had to be made. <coughs> now it's happened. They've watched someone they love die and die a horrendous death, die suffering. They saw horror. I don't blame them for where they were. They go and they hide out and they're trying to get their head on straight and I'm sure they're trying to think it all. I love the road to Emmaus. Oh, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall, only there was no wall. I'd have to be buzzing around their heads. But I love it because 
the Lord walks among the men. And they're talking to each other. They're down. They're discouraged. They're defeated. The one that they put hope in that was going to bring the kingdom, bring the glory, win the battle, he's just been crucified. They're hurting. And they're talking to each other. And he comes along side of them. What's going on, guys? What you talking about? <laughs> Haven't you heard? Where have you been? Don't you know the news? It was all over CNN and ABC and Channel 2 and 5 and it's everything morning, noon, and night. It's all we can talk about. And they're, they're hurting. And what does he do? He started from the scriptures. What scriptures? Had Matthew been written yet? No. no. None of the New Covenant had been written yet, but all of those prophecies that were the, what? Testimony of Yeshua, Jesus. He starts talking to him about it, and he starts expanding. Remember how in Bereshit you learned that there would be enmity between the woman's seed, and oh, by the way, the woman doesn't have seed, but the woman has seed because it's virgin birth. It's going to be enmity with the enemy, with the adversary, with his seed. And then he brings them maybe into Shemot, Exodus, and shows them the victory of his name in Exodus. Takes them through Yom Kippur. Takes in, in Viagra. I'm just trying to go in order fast. I haven't even hit the prophets. The prophets are full of prophecy. That's why they're called prophets. <laughs> he takes them through Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Haggai, Amos, Av Avalia. Who have I left out? Jonah, Mike, Micha. Every single one of them speaks of him. He's in every single book. And he starts talking to them. And you know what happens to them? What's happened to us today in this class? You feel him? You feel him? Is he jumping inside right now? Is he saying, yes, yes, this is my truth. This is the word. Is the spirit of God, uh, what's it called to your heart? He's, um, oh, what's the word? Heart, hearkening it to your heart. There's another word. Um, it's, he's revealing it to your heart. He's, he's, uh, I'll come in a minute. But, but he, he's, he's attesting to you that it's true. That's what the spirit does. That's why we're told, test the spirits when you hear. Quickening. Quickening, manifesting, not the word is after, but they both work. They both work. That's what the Spirit's doing. Well, as he's talking to them, all of a sudden, they're beginning to understand that they still don't have the full picture. They go into the house, and they go to the time when they're going to offer up a barucha, a blessing. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. Barucha ba, baruch There you go. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe. King. Get that king of the universe. And the moment he breaks bread and offers praise to his God, whoa, the eyes are open, the blindness is gone, they see that he's disappeared. I love it. I love it. They are so excited. They've been so down and so depressed. They run all the way back to Jerusalem. He's alive. He is risen. We've seen him. The Savior is alive. Miriam wasn't lying. When she said she saw him at the tomb, he is alive. He's alive today. He's alive in this room. He's alive in my heart. He is alive. That's what it was all about. But remember, they left him bloody. And then the first time they saw him, he is in his glory. Not the full glory of what we're going to see, but they see him whole and alive. They see him come through a building without opening a door. They see him ascend into heaven. He is alive. He is alive forevermore. He is alive. That's what it's all about. That's that full picture. I love the symbolism God gives us in our scripture. I love the Jewish traditions that should have shown them the whole picture. Yes, he came, went humble. He was bloody. He died. But he didn't stay dead. Good news is coming in the morning. He arose. He is alive. And now he is returning. And for all of those that know, who have studied, because there will be those that are of the orthodox persuasion that are still looking for, where's our king? 
they're going to see because we're told, and we'll get there, we're not getting there today because Rochelle's gone off on too many trails, but we're told in Zechariah 12, 10, let's go there, let's go there, let's get the complete thought, let's glorify our Lord. This will be coming right up in our study almost right away because we're moving from Battle of Armageddon into the Millennial Kingdom. And how does the Millennial Kingdom start? It starts with the King on Earth. How does that happen? He comes back and he stops the Battle of Armageddon. We're going to read that. We're going really, honestly, we're going to get there. Okay, <laughs> we're almost there. When Zechariah 12 and verse 10. Let me tell you that Romans 11, 25 to 27 talks about all of Israel being saved. Now. There are those who take those verses and they say, don't win this to the Jewish people. Don't worry about them. They're going to all be saved. It's all okay for them. That's not what it means. That's talking about the nation of Israel when it finally turns and sees its God. It's talking about Zechariah 12.10. But every single individual has to receive Yeshua for Savior, for salvation, to be their Messiah, as every individual Gentile. Nobody gets in because they're Jewish. Nobody gets in because they're born in Israel. Nobody gets in because they got an in with God. The Jews aren't ahead. They were the, the mouthpiece to carry the message. But they weren't put on a pedestal. You're better. You're okay. You got salvation. No. They had to. Remember, they had to make the sacrifices. If they didn't make the sacrifices, they were cut off. They didn't have an atonement. If they didn't have an atonement, they weren't at one meant with God. So they had to be saved also. But here is where they as a nation, because remember the battle of Armageddon, when we get there again, we're going to see it's all over the land of Israel. It's not just in Jerusalem. It's north and it's south. It is, it, it's 180 miles long that we read about. If you take the length of Israel, that covers more than two-thirds of the length of Israel. I believe that's what it's meaning. I'll give you a couple of other ideas when we get there, what it could mean. But I think it's really talking about that. Because we read about the battle in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. We read about the battle in Yerushalayim. We read about the battle in different locations. We did that when we were there. We'll review it quickly when we get to the end of chapter 19. And we will. But we're seeing it now with Zechariah 12.10. When he comes back from heaven, and hold on to that. Don't turn. I'll do it fast for you. I'm going to read to you Matthew 24, verse 30. You have taken you through Matthew 24 many times. You know it's in order. You know it shows the tribulation, and it shows, well, it shows rapture. It shows tribulation. Then it shows the coming of man, okay? And it says in verse 27 of chapter 24, For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines unto the west, so a lightning strike from the east to the west, everybody can see that, right? That's the point. I love, again, east to west, because remember, when you're going north, you suddenly you're going south. The east and west is always, and you can see east to west where you can't see north to south. If you're seeing north, you can't see south. But you can see, you can be east and look west. You can be west and look east, okay? And they're around. So, everyone, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, we're going to see, um, in verse 30, 30 is where he's headed the first time. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth, and that's not the Indian tribes, no offense to them, but Matthew's Jewish, and the tribes of Matthew's day are the 12 tribes. So, it's talking about the Jewish people. They're going to, to mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's not his first coming. He didn't come in clouds. He didn't come in glory. He came in a, as a baby, born in a stable, lay, lay, lay put in a feeding trough. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that was his beginning. The heavens declared the glory. The angels stepped out of heaven and declared it to the shepherds who should have known from studying the gospel and the stars what it all was meaning, and they brought it home. But that was a small part. This says, from the east to the west is going to see it. This says, the tribes are going to see and they're going to mourn. Why are they going to mourn? Well, let's take that to Zechariah now, 12.10. God speaking, and I, I, God, will pour out upon the house of David. Okay, Zechariah, are you a Jewish prophet, or are you in the Gentile world? Jewish. 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 He's speaking to the Jewish people, okay? So when he speaks of the house of David, the house of David, who is he talking about? 
The Filipinos? No. No offense, Filipinos, I love you. The Swedish? No. The Italians? No. Those in Rome? No. Spain? The Spaniards? No. No. He's speaking to Israel. The house of David is the very house he in his flesh was a part of. That's Israel. Yes. Okay. I will pour out on the house of David, on Israel, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Let's keep it in context. We've got Jerusalem. This is a geographical location. If I was putting down the name of my city and state, I would put down San Bernardino, comma, California. I'm going to do that for Jerusalem because there is a particular group of people, unnamed, but you'll know it, who want to say that this is taking place in a state in the United States. Is that what I'm going to write here? No. I'm going to put it in capital letters. Israel, and L means God. Ruler with God, prince with God. Israel, Jerusalem, Israel. There is a focus. Where is the battle of Armageddon? Israel. It's not in Utah. It's not in the Philippines. It's not in Italy. It's not in Spain. It's all over in Israel. In the valleys that I mentioned, in the city of Jerusalem, I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the Spirit. Here's your Spirit. Okay, now we got God, the Father, and we've got the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Okay? I will pour out the Spirit of grace. Thank God for His grace. Grace is what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. He, even though Israel doesn't deserve it, and we too, he is going to pour out his spirit. He said that, his spirit of grace and his supplications. Supplications, that's their heart cry. He is giving his all to Israel that's crying out. The supplications, and they shall look upon me. Okay, they're looking upon God then, because we said I was God, so me is God. Okay, they're going to look upon me whom they have pierced. When did they pierce God? The they we know is Jerusalem, is Israel. When did they pierce God? In the crucifixion. In the body of Yeshua, who is very God himself. Now you have your whole trinity. You've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Ruch HaKodesh, Holy Spirit. All three in one verse, all in this action. And they, uh, whom they pierce, when they see the piercings, when he comes back, you're going to see in his hands, you're going to see in his feet, the piercings. We're going to see that through all of eternity. We're going to be reminded of the high cost of our salvation. We're going to be remembered, reminded of why we adore him and praise him and thank him, and why we fall at his feet and worship him, because he was pierced. And he was pierced there in Israel. They're going to mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Son, hmm. what did we read in Isaiah 9, 6? Unto you a son is given. This is the only son. We missed it. That was his first coming. Those who have been telling us that he came once and he's coming again, they're right. He is one and the same. This king of kings is also that suffering servant. He is also that one who is going to be pierced for us. And oh, yes, they're going to cry. They're going to mourn. And yet God says, I'm going to pour out my grace on their supplications. And their mourning and bitterness is one for his firstborn. Have you ever been through the death of a firstborn yeah. child with a parent? I don't think there could be anything that hurts worse. Not to minimize, you never replace a child with a child, but when they have other children, their whole nest hasn't been empty. But when it's their firstborn, and that firstborn dies, it's almost a grief that they can't bear. Ask them. And they carry it every day the rest of their life. They learn to live with it through the power of the Lord. But Israel is going to realize in agony, we missed him. 
We rejected him. And those who are saying that and realizing it at that moment, like the thief on the cross, receive their salvation because they are acknowledging he is God. He is the Messiah. He is the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. And in that moment, God allows them to be brought into saving faith. There's the salvation of Israel. Unfortunately, not every eye is going to see that and agree with that. There will be those who see who are going to be bitter. They are not going to cry out for forgiveness. They are going to still trample underfoot the very name of my God, that ineffable name that I hallow, that I honor, that I've been describing from A to Z and, and can't contain. Sadly, not all will. We've got to get the word out. We need to, to be witnesses and light, not just to Israel, but it is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, just because God put it in order. He wants all to be saved. He died equally for that Gentile. He loves you as much as he loves that Jew that he dies for. But this is what it's all about. This is what we're reading here. This is that one who is coming now to judge rightfully because those who have rejected deserve to be punished. They deserve to be cast out. They don't love my God and my Savior. They still want to spit on his name, trample his name under their feet. They still have a fist at God. They are going to feel the fullness of his wrath when he comes back and slays the enemy, stops the battle, and sets up and fulfills the promises to Israel, to those who now believe. That is the unconditional promise of my God. Amen. Wow. Wow. Let me give you this, this final note. I know I'm past. I know I've got to quit. But notice what he's stained with. He is not stained with the blood of the cross. He is not. He is stained with the blood from war, from the enemy. Not stained in his own blood. You see, he doesn't come in grace here. He comes as judge. He comes to judge the world, not to save the world. He came to save the world the first time. Now he's coming to judge the world. You see, if you, if, if man rejects the written word, he's going to stand before the living word of God. And he's going to stand in judgment. That's why we need to be a witness and a light that we can hopefully bring them to that point where the Ruach HaKodesh tugging at their heart gets them to open up their heart and accept the Lord. That's what it's all about. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Yeshua Jesus. Spread it out. Take it out. Introduce them to how great our God is. But make sure they know their personal need. Make sure they understand Him as Savior because He can't be Lord if He's not Savior. <coughs> he is Lord, but He won't be their Lord. And in that, they'll lose. They'll be cast out. When we come back next week, we'll start with the Word of God, with His incarnation. We'll build on this thing that we have right here, and uh, we'll see just a little bit more, but then we'll go right into the armies, the battle, where it is, all of that that I've been promising. And if we travel enough, if we travel enough, we get back to the victory. Victory comes again in verse 16, so it's not that far, but we'll go from that victory then into the Millennial Kingdom. You're, I'll, I'll finally get to say you made it through the tribulation. <laughs> Only praise God is not us. Yes. But he goes to Valley Armageddon. Valley.
grapples them with the, with the two-edged sword, and that which is the word of God. So where right. does the blood come in on this clothing? Because what does a sword do? If a sword is annihilating, if it's Cut if it's cutting and them, and it's judging them, uh, it's shedding their blood. They did not come into his blood. Now their blood is being shed because the wages of sin is death. Yeah. So that blood is their blood. It's the splattering from the death that's taking place around them and the annihilation from the, out of his mouth when he puts a stop. He says, if I didn't stop, there wouldn't be flesh left alive. So the death is all around. The blood is already high. And then more is shed in his coming of those who are rejected. They lose their human life at that point. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, because the beef is the bridle on the horse. Yeah. And we talked about it. We will again. I'll give you again the statistics. But that blood is about 200 miles long. And what did it say the Battle of Armageddon was? About 200 miles long. And the blood up that high. Wow. Yes. Yeah, because it's the word of God that slays them. They're slain by his word. They're slain by the power out of his mouth. He says it in the heavens. In essence, I mean, I don't know that you're literally going to see the heads chopped up, but you're going to see them come to their end. You're going to see the battle was stopped. He has won. There's not going to be any that come against him. Because when they see him, they're going to want to battle against him. But the, they can't. They can't. He's king. He's lord. He's mighty. He's majesty. He is... The final word. The final word. Foolish. Yes. Okay, let's close in prayer so that those who need to go can go. Lord God, I'm empty. You are just amazing and awesome. And oh Lord God, we thank you for our salvation. We praise you that we are in your blood, that we have no worry and no fear of this coming battle of you coming in against us, pouring your wrath out on us. Lord God, thank you. You have given us a victory in your holy name. You are righteous and true. You are ineffable. We love to hear your name and can't wait to learn your new name. Oh, Lord God, let us wear that name even now without us knowing how and what it is. Still put it on us even now, Lord. Let us go out in your power. Let us go out in your glory. Let us go out as your servants. Let us go out and shout it to the mountaintops that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is coming, and they need to be ready. Lord, use us. You've privileged us to be saved. You give us a ability. You don't look for ability. You just look for availability. So here we are, Lord. Take us. Use us this week. May we glorify you, and may souls be saved, that more can be home with us in that glorious day of your soon appearing. Thank you now. We praise you forever and ever and ever, and together we shout, Hallelujah! Amen. Amen. Amen.